Welcome to Mormon Facts. While modern members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints understand Joseph Smith's first vision to be the inciting event for the formation of the Church and a central part of their faith, this was not the case for Church members during Smith's lifetime. Joseph Smith claimed to be visited by God and Jesus Christ in 1820 when he was 14 years old in Palmyra, New York. According to the church, this event, now referred to as the First Vision, is the moment when the heavens were again opened and the restoration of Christ's church began. Speaking to members of the church in General Conference, Gordon B. Hinckley, the president of the church at the time, said, Our whole strength rests on the validity of that vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. Assuming that the marvelous foundation of the church would be written and published immediately to the world, many members are surprised to discover that Smith's account of the first vision was written in 1838 and published in 1842 for the first time, 22 years after it occurred. Despite Gordon B. Hinckley's further claim that in all recorded religious history there is nothing to compare with the first vision, scholars have found no evidence that the general church membership received information about the first vision until the 1840s, and that the story certainly did not hold the prominent place in Mormon thought that it does today. This video is brought to you by the podcast Ex-Mormons Search for Meaning on Life After Faith Crisis, a narrative podcast following the experience of someone reconstructing a belief system after leaving the Mormon church. More details following the end of this video. James B. Allen, official assistant church historian of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said, None of the available contemporary writings about Joseph Smith in the 1830s, none of the publications of the church in that decade, and no contemporary journal or correspondence yet discovered mentions the story of the first vision. Dr. Allen goes on to state that in the 1830s, the general membership of the church knew little, if anything, about it. Throughout the church's infancy and growth, there were many publications made by the church in its efforts to educate the world about its beliefs, none of which mention the first vision. In 1833, the church published the Book of Commandments, forerunner to the present Doctrine and Covenants with no reference to Smith's first vision, although several references were made to the Book of Mormon and the circumstances of its origin. The Latter-day Saints Messenger and Advocate was printed in Kirtland, Ohio from October 1834 to September 1836. In this newspaper, Oliver Cowdery, who was second to Joseph Smith in the early organization of the church, published a series of letters detailing the origin of the church. They contained no mention of any vision prior to those connected with the Book of Mormon. In 1835, the Doctrine and Covenants was printed at Kirtland, Ohio, and its preface declared that it contained the leading items of religion which we have professed to believe. In demonstrating the doctrine that the Godhead consists of two separate personages, no mention was made of Joseph Smith having seen them, nor was any reference made to the first vision. The first important missionary pamphlet of the church was The Voice of Warning, published in 1837 by Parley P. Pratt. The book contains long sections on items important to missionaries of the 1830s, but nothing again on the first vision. If something happened that spring morning in 1820, it passed totally unnoticed in Joseph's hometown. The Palmyra New York newspapers, which in later years gave him plenty of unpleasant publicity, took no notice of Joseph's vision at the time it was supposed to have occurred. In fact, Dogberry insisted in the Palmyra Reflector, 
It, however, appears quite certain that the Prophet himself never made any serious pretensions to religion until his late pretended revelation, the discovery of the Book of Mormon. And it apparently did not even fix itself in the minds of the members of his own family. Lucy Smith, when writing to her brother in 1831, said nothing about the first vision. There is also no record of adversaries of the new church knowing about the first vision either. In Smith's account, printed along with the first vision, he states that persecution was heaped upon him as a result of his vision, all the time suffering severe persecution at the hands of all classes of men, both religious and irreligious, because I continued to affirm that I had seen a vision. The first significant critical book of Mormonism, Mormonism Unveiled, printed November 15, 1833, made no mention of the first vision. It may be claimed that Smith gave an account of his first vision to Erastus Holmes, a member of a Methodist church who visited him in Kirtland to inquire about the church in November 1835, which he wrote in his personal journal at the time. This was subsequently published in the Deseret News on Saturday, May 29, 1852, and then published in History of the Church, which says, Erastus Holmes called on me to inquire about the establishment of the church. I gave him a brief relation of my experience while in my juvenile years, say from six years old up to the time I received my first vision. Yet, when his account was incorporated into the history of the church, it changed. A scan of the Deseret News article originally read First Visitation of Angels, but was amended to read First Vision. So what did serve as the inciting event, according to Smith, to reestablish Christ's true church? The Book of Commandments, written soon after the church was organized, now found in Doctrine and Covenants, says... After repenting and humbling himself sincerely through faith, God ministered unto him by an holy angel, and gave him power from on high, by the means which were before prepared to translate the Book of Mormon, proving to the world that God does inspire men and call them to his holy work. Consistent with this passage is the earliest published account of Mormon history begun with Joseph's collaboration in 1834 by Oliver Cowdery, published in the periodical Latter-day Saints Messenger and Advocate in February 1835. There, Oliver reports a story very similar to the one Smith recounted in the official 1842 version, except the time period was 1823, three years later than the official account. And the location was not a sacred grove, but Smith's home bedroom. In this account, Smith was urged forward and strengthened in the determination to know for himself of the certainty and reality of pure and holy religion. His heart was drawn out in fervent prayer. On a sudden, a light like that of day, only of a purer and far more glorious appearance and brightness, burst into the room. And in a moment, a personage stood before him. The visitation of the angel, later identified as Moroni, is what Joseph Smith originally claimed called him to the work, rather than Jesus in the first vision. While these widely divergent accounts raise serious questions about the authenticity of Joseph Smith's first vision story, it also raises the question as to what motivated Smith to publish his first vision story when he did in 1842, 22 years after it supposedly occurred. While we can't know Joseph Smith's motivations for certain, by 1842, Smith was becoming entangled in the conflicts that would end in his death two years later. Smith married at least 11 women that year of 1842 and was on track to marry 17 more before the end of 1843. But these marriages were not yet public knowledge. John C. Bennett, at the time a counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, threatened that secrecy. He was caught spreading the idea to Nauvoo women that illicit sexual intercourse was acceptable if kept secret. At the same time, Missourians were busy trying to extradite the Mormons living there. 
Thomas Sharp had created the anti-Mormon party to oppose Mormons in Illinois and was exposing them in his newspaper. All while the temple in Nauvoo House, two huge construction projects remained to be completed and the debt to construct them mounted. It appears as if Joseph's use of historical revisionism was motivated at least in part as a bulwark against mounting threats to his prophetic authority. For those who leave the Mormon church, a large portion of time is dedicated to the doctrinal inaccuracies, the historical doublespeak, and the disingenuous explanations for hidden church history. The often neglected but no less important question is, what's next? The Ex-Mormon Search for Meaning podcast is a chapter-by-chapter -chapter narration of a book by the same name written by Zach Olson. In it, he sets out to establish a new belief system after leaving Mormonism, drawing on psychology, physics, ancient philosophy, mysticism, and the nature of reality itself. Follow the link in the description below to start listening now.